Welcome to the Advanced Sports Analytics Show here on Roto Grinders, brought to you by Jock Market. Stop throwing your money away. It's time to check out Jock Market, the app where daily fantasy becomes a stock exchange. Buy and sell shares of players in real time for real money. Download now for a hundred percent deposit match, up to fifty bucks, using the promo code Grinders. And get this: if you don't turn a profit this week, Jock Market is running back their first market guarantee to cover your losses in week three. Download. Jock Market in the app or play stores, or check out Jock Market at the site J O C K M A T dot com. Jock Market, J O C K M K T dot com, and use the promo code GRINDERS for a 100% deposit match up to 50 bucks on your first deposit. I'm Jordan Cooper, aka Blender Ed, here with Stuart Gibson, the man behind the numbers at Advanced Sports Analytics. And for the first time this year, Brandon. Adams, uh, Brandon, uh, have you noticed anything the first uh, two weeks of the year? I know uh, we, we talked to Stewart about like how you plan for a new season. Obviously, last season we had some you know, COVID issues. So some of the data from then could be, you know, we had high scoring games, less defense. Is there anything specifically uh, the first two weeks of this season that you've noticed or you've adjust your your strategy based on what you've seen? No, I don't read too much into the results of the first two weeks. Um, I think, let's see, week one was like a break even week for me. And then week two was a bad week. I think I had like 11 GPP lineups in one cash or something. I'm assuming Um, you didn't have any Derrick Henry. That's probably the reason. I I didn't have any Derrick Henry. Um, Although I was sort of looking back at it. And I saw that his prop was 130 with juice on the over. Like his prop was like minus 115, 130 yards, which is like the highest prop that I can remember. Um, That's an insane rush prop. So although we tend not to like to play Derrick Henry because he doesn't catch passes and he doesn't seem to flash the upside for the price, and we especially don't like to play him on slates like week two, where you would expect the, the winning score to be very, very high. Um, I can understand why people played him because that prop was insane. I, I, I frankly didn't notice the prop before uh, kickoff. I only, <laughs> I only noticed it when I was doing the, the regret retrospective. Well, I mean, I think the thing that, that surprised us about Henry the past two weeks was they're actually throwing the ball to him. Like in, in, compared to previous years, Stewart, uh, this, this, we have two weeks worth of sample size, right? I mean, we're always dealing with uh, small sample sizes in NFL. When, when you're running through NFL projections for like this week, like how much are you taking into account the new offensive coordinator and the fact that Derrick Henry was on the field when they're down catching dump offs uh, you would have to think that I don't believe from what I've seen that they were like designed to pass plays. Do you take into account, Stuart, like whether or not like the game script led to, you know, uh, an, uh, an inflated target share for certain players or, or do you regress it just normally like you would with, with any data? Yeah. I mean, so we're not trying to predict, uh, you know, targets as a scalar number but more like target share um i think that's just kind of a more conservative way to go and and kind of let uh indicators like uh spread uh speed kind of of of, uh you know the titans and their opponent dictate like what that raw number might come to um yeah i mean I, i do think to some extent like you you should be taking into account uh new offensive coordinator but like there are other parameters that i think could dictate 
uh, us being more responsive to changes. So like one thing I was just looking at this morning was kind of a projection on Lamar Jackson's rush share, they, you know, through two weeks. Uh, I mean, last week he had a huge rush share, I think like uh, up over 35% um, looking at designed rushes, not, not scrambles. Um, you know, I kind of asked myself like, all right, well, you know, I, I do think there is something systemically different with this Ravens roster. You know, they don't have a reliable kind of RB1 the same way they did last year, or at the very least, like a, re a reliable committee. Um, so I think uh, I'm kind of taking it like case by case basis um, and, and, and trying to identify, OK, is there something materially different in the way that the current roster uh, or current coaching staff or kind of regime uh, is handling a certain player? Uh looking at roster, looking at coaching staff. And then from there, you know, not, not like fully embracing, like, I don't, you know, I, I think, uh, let's see, Henry had a 15% target share last week. That was the second highest he's had dating back to the beginning of last year. So like, you know, maybe projecting him up a little bit, probably not all the way up to 15%. Now, if he continues to log 15% uh, approaching 20% target share games, you know, maybe then, uh, we might want to adjust up, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think like with a lot of these things, it's kind of safe to take the middle uh, understanding. And, you know, the way we project things out, like we're not training, you know, past outcomes on the observed target share, but rather on a predicted target share from the past. So like, you know, I think a good model should understand that, well, a guy who's predicted at 11% target share, could achieve 16, he could achieve five, he could achieve zero, he could achieve 20. And there are kind of different probabilities of that occurring. Um, so I do think like a well, well-designed model should take into consideration like, okay, if, if we're projecting Henry for a certain amount of target share, that's maybe above his kind of usual projection. Uh, of course, there are, there are outcomes where he achieves some target share higher than that. And therefore that's going to kind of impact um, his projection accordingly and certainly give him act, you know, in, in the projection system, give him access to a ceiling where, uh, you know, he could go off for 30 points if he uh, is projected at 11% target share, but like achieves 17 or achieves 15 or something like that. Um, so, so that's kind of how we're handling uh, making these, these predictions on what's going to happen. And then also how we kind of construct the model to be flexible, to understand that, well, if we expect one thing, it, it doesn't mean that there can't be outcomes that are kind of uh, on some sort of bell curve or maybe even a skewed curve uh, of probability centered around that point that we're projecting. Well, when we're talking about a curve of probabilities on games that shoot out, which is, you know, you build game stacks into your lineups for those outcomes. We're looking at the highest total games. Typically, they have the most likelihood of shooting out, and that's what we cover on this show. Game, game stacks, correlations, leverage. So let's get to it. There's five games that have a 50-point total and over. The first one, the top right now, currently on the betting market, is uh, the Seahawks at the Vikings. Uh, it is a 56 total. It opened at 56. It's currently at 56. Uh, the Vikings are the Seahawks are a one point road favorite, 28.5 implied total for them. Vikings, 27.5 total for them. Uh, based on our current ownership, uh, we have uh, the, the running backs are generating a decent amount. Dalvin Cook uh, stands to be one of the, the higher owned backs of the of the of the slate at 8400. Carson getting some uh, cheap KJ Osborne, which in two weeks has shown a decent target share for the Vikings. But outside of that, not so much. I think out of the, these, these higher total games, there are two other games that are getting way more attention than this one. Uh, Stuart, uh, with, with the correlations here, the main issue that I have is that the passing games, like outside of KJ Osborne, like this game is pretty expensive. So even though that it's a 56 total game and the highest on the board, uh, do you think, in, especially in large field GPPs, there would be a merit in playing something like a Wilson, Lockett, Metcalf, Jefferson, or a Cousins, Jefferson, Thielen? We're dealing with both sides have much more condensed offenses, so we like that. The problem is that all these receivers are like 7K+. plus. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is going to be an expensive build. Uh, I don't think it'll 
generate a ton of ownership. Um, when we, when I've simulated through like lineup constructions, I've got Seattle stacks being accounting for like close to 6% uh, of stacks, which I think is relatively low considering uh, how high the total is. And um, yeah, so, so I'm very intrigued on the Seattle side. I, I would say Minnesota uh, to a lesser extent. I'm not sure what you guys have for the ownership of like Cousins versus Wilson, but I mean, we're, we're projecting Wilson for just kind of slightly more ownership than Cousins. And like, I just, I don't know, to me, it just feels like, you know, Wilson should be owned at just like a significantly higher rate uh, uh, than Cousins, given his, his rushing equity, given uh, I think the condensed nature of that Seattle offense. Um, you know, I think it is going to be tough to go like Lockett plus Metcalf. I think on slates where there is like more uh, value available, I think it would be in consideration. I mean, we saw like an expensive stack like Kansas City uh, be really effective in week one when there was a ton of receiver value, uh, not seeing like quite as much value this week. So I do think it's going to be tough to go uh, with both those guys. But on the Seattle side, I mean, I think you could just single stack the game. Uh, I wouldn't even be opposed to throwing in like a guy like Freddie Swaim in there. Uh, you know, we've seen kind of the wide receiver three role for Seattle in the past be uh, one that can bear fruit. Uh, and, you know, he did have a pretty solid, you know, 16% tar target share uh, last week. I had the big touchdown. Uh, Everett, of course, you know, is uh, at the tight end position. You're kind of just I don't want to say throwing darts. I mean, I think we want to take a more nuanced approach than that. But, um, you know, I think just choosing the tight end that, you know, receiving tight end with the quarterback that you want to stack is typically a decent approach. So, um, you know, I do think going like one of Metcalf or Lockett and then going with say like Swaim or uh, Everett could make sense. Um, you know, the bring back on the Minnesota side uh, could go Jefferson, could go Thielen, could go Osborne. Um, no, I, I like this game stacking from the Seattle side a good bit and uh, would guess come Sunday. It's a, it's a build that I'm uh, a little overweight on. Brandon, with the fact that these running backs are projected to get decent ownership, Cook, we have currently a 20% ownership, Carson around 17. And other than KJ Osborne at 10, these receivers obviously have a ceiling. Uh, their direct leverage over these running backs, are you more inclined to play this game, even as a skinny stack, such as Wilson plus one of Metcalf or Lockett plus one of Jefferson or Thielen, do you think that the the expense of those three players combined is worth the relative value you get over one the running backs that are going to be owned and the fact that probably two other games with these to types of totals are going to be more owned than this one? Yeah, my approach here would be the uh, I, I would tend to take the receiver one off and then the run back. So I'll probably play two from this game. This isn't the game that I will uh, do much stacking on. If I were stacking, I would I would tend to go with a primary receiver and a, and a tight end, the sort of punt tight ends that that Stuart mentions um, on if I choose not to have the receivers and instead have the, the running backs, I, I wouldn't in this game try to do a full game stack with the running backs and the receivers. Um, if I were going running back, um, Dalvin Cook is my man. I would not want to run him this week. Um, I think he's going to be highly owned given that Henry just beat up on the Seahawks. I also think that he's slightly beaten up and Madison is very competent. So I could see some sort of split between Cook and Madison. Um, and moreover, as, as you know, Blender, um, I favor a lineup construction with cheap running backs and expensive wide receivers on weeks that figure to be especially high scoring like this one. Okay, so uh, is the reason that you're less likely to game stack more due to the fact that you don't believe that Russ or Kirk cousins is going to necessarily be QB one alongside your stack, or is it just due to the fact that they're just more appealing options elsewhere? Um, it's that I don't think it sets up well as a game stack because of the correlations. Stuart can help me out a bit here, but as I remember it, basically, uh, 
Lockett and Metcalf have uh, correlations such that you can actually game stack the Russ Lockett Metcalf. They're, they can both go off together. I'm not positive that I'm remembering that correctly, but I, I think you can on a normal week, but this week, because it figures to be a very high scoring week and because both of those guys are priced above 7K, I don't think it sets up as a slate where you want to run both those guys. The Minnesota, I, I'm pretty certain that you don't want to play Thielen and Jefferson together uh, based on correlations, but Stuart can can fix me up on that. Yeah, so the, the Lockett Metcalf thing, I think early in Metcalf's career, particularly his you know, rookie year, um, I think there was evidence of there being kind of potentially good correlative properties or really that, you know, and, and relative to their price, you know, of course, Metcalf has come up a ton uh, in terms of price since really his rookie year that I think there were good routes to fitting them in. But I mean, if you look back to last year, um, it, it's kind of been one or the other. Um, and certainly with the price hike that we've seen uh, on Metcalf over the last one plus years, I think it's become kind of increasingly difficult uh, to pair those two guys together. Um I don't have the Jefferson Thielen uh, correlation in front of me right now, but I mean, similarly, like Jefferson's price has come up a ton uh, such that I could see it being difficult. It looks like there's kind of slightly negative uh, to no correlation historically between those two guys. Like, uh, you know, a, a great Thielen game usually is a floor Jefferson game. Um, historically a ceiling Jefferson game has, been kind of variable as far as the, the outcomes for Thielen. Um, to me, it, it feels like a spot maybe also to stay away from uh, double stacking those two guys, uh, and especially with the emergence of Osborne. Like if you're if you're high on that game environment, right? Couldn't, it seems like you could just get easier or cheaper rather access to uh, you know two two players in the receiving core via Osborne uh, and really one of those other two guys. Um, is how I, I'm thinking about it. Well, on to the next game that has, well, I believe a double stack that you possibly don't play just due to ownership. Next game on the docket is the Buccaneers, Tampa Bay at the LA Rams. It's a 55 and a half total opened up at 54. Uh, the Buccaneers are now a one point road favorite uh, in LA. Uh, that's a 28.25 implied total for the Bucks and 27.25 for the Rams. This figures to be the most owned game on the slate. We have Godwin, Cup, Evans, Higby, Woods, all at double-digit ownership. We have Stafford, and uh, we have Stafford at almost 10% and Brady at 5%. I mean, the most obvious thing here, I mean, just based on projections and how you construct your lineup, is Stafford plus Woods plus Cup plus Godwin, but I, that, that exact combination may literally be like fully 10% total ownership of like all the lineups in like a, the slant or the Millie or something uh, based on their price. And based on the projection, I'm assuming the correlation works out. Uh, Stuart, based on your, your top stack percentages, I have to would think that this comes out high, but does it come out high enough that it's warranted to play a stack just like that with the ownership the way it is. Yeah, I mean, both teams come out great from a value standpoint, uh, but not very well from a kind of simulated ROI for really the reasons you talked about. I mean, Stafford, we have as the, the highest ownership quarterback. Uh, Brady, outside of the top five, looks like maybe seventh highest. Uh, yeah, and then the receivers, like uh, really the three guys you mentioned, Cup, Woods, Godwin, uh, we currently have as three of the four most owned receivers. Um, so yeah, I mean, of course, of course the value is great, but like we saw last week, I mean, you, you did yourself a huge service, uh, by staying away from, uh, large kind of bunches of that Los Angeles Dallas game. And I think, I mean, I think just from an ownership standpoint, like this game sets up quite similarly, right? Like people are very excited about, uh, both sides of the ball, uh, there's going to be a lot of people, I'm sure, you know, thinking they have kind of the, the stack that no one's seeing or, um, you know, I, I, I don't know, or, or just not thinking about ownership and just thinking that they have like the nuts because of value. 
uh, I don't know when, when you simulate it out, like even if these guys hit value, which, you know, seems likely uh, if I don't know, you know, 15% of the field is stacking uh, Stafford Woods cup Godwin or whatever, uh, maybe 10% on that stack and, you know, 15% on like just LA stacks in general, like, it, you know, you, you, you still have a lot more, a lot more work to do, even if, even if that uh, kind of group of players is the nuts. And um, I don't know, I, I think uh, our, our simulation data would suggest that you, you're probably a little better off uh, avoiding those and just kind of counting on uh, being set or strategizing to be like in a great position, should that game, uh, as a whole fail. Uh, so, so I, I, I would guess I'm going to be uh, significantly underweight, uh, on stacking this game and like, yeah, I mean, it's really just an ownership thing. I mean, like I, I thought Tampa was like an excellent play last week where there was limited ownership. Um, there was going to be so much more tension on the other games. Uh, but, but this week I just, I'm not sure that that's going to be the case, uh, especially with a big week from Brady, uh, Gronkowski, Evans, you know, showed up, uh, Godwin had a nice game. So, and, and no, no AB like, or potentially no AB. Uh, I just think the ownership is going to be too much to overcome uh, and it would be a game that I would want to be uh, underweight on. Brandon, I hope, I hope we're on the same side here. I hope we're on the same side because there's, there's two guys that I like in this game and it's none of the guys that we just mentioned. Do you believe from the fact that we we both very similar, like playing certain types of lineup constructions, and I like playing the the negative correlation to uh, to high owned players. Do you think that based on the ownership at like sub three percent owned each, that the plays in this game are Daryl Henderson and Leonard Fournette, and then just not play the stack at all, or are you more likely to just say this is the best game? I'm going to play the stack, and I'll find something else different elsewhere. Um, I, I am not going to be stacking this game, but I, I like, uh, Robert Woods a good bit. Um, if I recall, he had a very, very good showing, uh, last year in this matchup. And I think he's out of, out of favor for no reason in the DFS community. And he historically has had a bit more upside than cup. Um, so I, I think his pricing is very good and I like to have a lot of uh, Robert Woods this week. Um, Fournette and Henderson. I, I can see the case. Their price is right about where I want to be in my lineups this week. Um, I, um, they weren't previously on my radar, but I, I, I like, I like that price point this week and you're playing for two touchdowns when everyone else is heavy on the wide receiver and um, reasonable chance that happened. So I, I, I like the play. Right. Re re really. It's not that, you know, I necessarily think Fournette and Henderson are like from a value perspective or projection perspective, good, but I mean, for them to be in that low owned uh, price range for running back, like, there are other running backs that project around the same, but they're not in games that have 15 to 20% owned players that will obviously take points away from because a lot of people will not go to the running backs in this game because it's pretty much two good run defenses, supposedly, right? If we go by prior data and it's very hard for me to see like the other way to get different in this game is by playing like Van Jefferson or a Tyler Johnson and it just it just seems like the upside isn't there enough that I'm willing to throw in one of these 3K guys instead because I still don't think I'm getting different enough in my line. Yeah, I I believe that we see these high scoring weeks the same way, which is that historically, um, when the point totals are this high, you have had winning scores way up there sort of 250 ish kind of thing um and the simplistic way to think about it is that you have you have your high-end running backs like dalvin cook and henry that this week are priced 8.4 8.6k then you have your high priced receivers that are that are priced 7500 
plus. Historically, on weekends like this, your $4,000 wide receivers who outperform are not able to match the $8,000 wide receivers that have a good week. Even, even though the $4,000 guy kind of quote unquote goes off and far exceeds value, he's historically speaking, not reaching the ceilings that the, that the 7,500 player uh, receivers that go off are reaching. So you really want to concentrate your spending on these slates on those high dollar receivers. However, at the, at the running back position, you can find that 5k running back that sneaks around the same total as Dalvin cook on a good day. Now, in say 2019 or 2018, we did have a surprising number of weeks where McCaffrey, let's say the, what, the high price running back goes off to such an extent that you kind of need him in your lineups. But I kind of view that period as a little bit of an anomaly. And really what you want to do is have on a week like this, the construction of low to mid price running back that on a good week can match your cook McCaffrey, whatever. Um, and then high price wide receiver and low priced tight end, like a Higby or whatever that could on a good week match your, your high price tight ends. Well, talking about high price tight ends, let's go to the next game. Uh, that is the chargers at the chiefs. It is a 54 and a half total currently. It opened up at 55. The Chiefs are a six and a half point favorite, 30.5 implied total for the Chiefs, 24 implied total for the Chargers. Obviously, in this game, we got Tyreek Hill, Travis Kelsey, Pat Mahomes, really expensive. You got some cheap pieces in there if you wanted to, wanted to take a shot on Hardman or Jack or Pringle and uh, Demarcus Robinson. We also have uh, a really bump down price on Clyde Edwards Hilaire on DraftKings at 4,800. And then on the Chargers side, we got Eckler, Allen, Mike Williams. Herbert is going to be one of the more owned quarterbacks, if not, you know, one of the top three owned quarterbacks on the slate. It always comes down, Stuart, for these, these, these Chiefs types of stacks is that, yes, they all have the ability have sleep breaking performances, but you know, to obviously to double stack, you're spending almost half of your lineup on it. My problem, even in this game to do you to do my whole, uh, you know, leverage play thing is that I'll, I'm the one that plays Clyde Edwards Hilaire at 6,300 when the chiefs are chalky. Well, now that Clyde Edwards Hilaire is 4,800 based on our ownership. Do you actually think that the, because of the Rams game, and we have other high total uh, slates that uh, a Patrick Mahomes, Tyreek Hill, because Kelsey will be owned in the tight end spot because tight end is more of a weaker position. So do you think that playing a Mahomes single stack with Tyreek Hill is actually the, the more contrarian way to play this game? Yeah, I do. Um, we've got positive grades on, on both, both sides uh, of this game in Kansas City. Uh, a little bit ahead of Los Angeles. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't expect ownership to be super high. I think, I think the cost uh, is going to be, uh, you know, push people away. And like you said, uh, CEH, I think is going to be very popular. Um, and, you know, I was going to just jump in even on the Fournette thing, but I think like Clyde Edwards Hilaire is uh, kind of the, the counterpoint that I'm curious to pick your brain about. Like, do you sense that, I, it just seems like the, the the ownership and kind of even DraftKings pricing and just public perception seems to anchor quite closely to running backs uh, running potential, the kind of running efficiency of the defense they're playing. Um, and I mean, I'm just looking like through kind of some of our like uh, projection inputs and man, it's just like, it just feels like there are, have there have been a few weeks in the past where there are just so many guys that so many running backs at the position that are kind of like in this sub 6k range that you can project for, you know, double digit uh, target share. And it, it just seems like uh, on average, like those guys per dollar kind of have a better chance of beating out uh, 
these guys like CH, who really, except for early in last season, has not uh, had a significant pass catching role. Um, even though like a, a similarly priced Leonard Fournette, while he might not have the same rushing role as CH, like he he is a guy that that is you know can get five plus targets in a game, and it just seems like I mean we even saw it like last week with you know Najee and uh, Darrell Henderson and Carson. Um, you know, it just feels like ownership still kind of gravitates towards, uh, you know, these guys that are projectable for, for a high rushing role. And like, it makes sense, be, you know, I do think like rush share is more stable than target share, you know, because teams design, they scheme to, you know, hand off the ball to certain players as were targets, uh, you know, rarely are, aside from like screen passes, you know, plays aren't really set up to specifically pass the ball to a player, but um yeah, I don't know. I, to me, it just feels like you know, from an upside standpoint, you know, given how DraftKings rewards uh, the reception, uh, it just feels to me like there's so much more upside with these pass catching running backs uh, than there is the, the rushing running backs. And, um, you know, maybe maybe the rushing guys make for stable options and cash play. But for tournament purposes, like, you know, if CEH is going to get, you know, no more than like two targets or something, uh, sure, he could you know, find his way into the end zone. And, uh, you know, if you don't have him, you're dead. But uh, I don't know, for me, I, I would rather uh, be rostering like pass catching running backs uh, and, um, you know, avoiding guys like CEH. And like you said, you know, I do think that the Mahomes uh, Tyreek, or you could go Mahomes Kelsey, I think throwing in like a, a Hardman still, you know, could make sense. Uh Obviously is, you know, great leverage against kind of the CEH, but yeah, I mean, I'm curious to kind of hear your thoughts on like, evaluating running backs rushing potential relative compared to their pass catching potential and how you see the field uh, rostering running backs kind of based on that dichotomy. Well, I think, I think people cut tar, uh, focus a little too much on the pass catching and not on the touchdown upside. So, I mean, like I'd, I'd much rather play uh, a running back on a team that is projected to score a lot of points and then hope it comes on the ground. Cause I think the ceilings, I mean, the ceilings obviously come from a mix of them, right? Like I played Chase Edmonds last week. And like the, 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 the problem with Chase Edmonds that people have is that because Connor's there, that he's not going to see much red zone work. And it's like, well, he catches enough passes. That I don't even care at that point, but it has to be on that barbell end. Like Austin Eckler could catch 10 passes out of the backfield. Even if he doesn't have goal line duty, I'm, I could still get a ceiling. From that, it's the guys that are in the middle that I really tend to avoid. But Brandon, what are you doing this week with both Clyde Edwards Hilaire just in general at running back? Because he fits the bill of cheap running back. Do you like those types of builds? But at 15 to 20 percent ownership, and then you have the Chargers who are going to get ownership also. You're going to see a lot of Herbert, Allen, Kelsey type of lineups. Uh, is there a way to get different in this game? Is this a game that at the price you're looking to target or, or you're looking to more avoid and hope this game disappoints. Um, I like Edwards Hilaire, even at reasonably high ownership. Um, I think you'd go ahead and roll him. It's probable that he'll be like in that 20% ownership range. And I think it's fine. Um, I think I'll have a good bit of him because I see it as like he's gonna he's gonna have 18, 20 points a lot of the time. And I I think there's like a decent chance that he has 25, 30 points, in which case he's almost a must-have. Um, but I I don't think he hurts you very often. Um I like him quite a bit. So, it's, but it's more of a price consideration. Like if he was sixty two hundred, that would mean maybe a little bit different. But at forty eight hundred, like if he puts up fourteen points at forty eight hundred, like that may still be fine because, like, what other running backs in the four to five k range are even going to put up that many? I mean, essentially, you're matching a wide receiver in that range rather than try to like at forty eight hundred. Are you necessarily trying to match Dalvin Cook? Or are you just getting enough points to match like any 4K wide receiver at that point? Because you're paying up at the other wide receiver positions. Is, is that more of the issue that it's not 
Clyde Edwards Alaire at that ownership. It's more like a price consideration more than anything. Yeah, the price is so good that he doesn't need two touchdowns to get there. Like um, he can get 20 with one touchdown. And if he gets two touchdowns, it's excellent. If he gets zero touchdowns, you're going to lose. Um, but um, I think it's a it's a worthy gamble. Like I think he's far and away the highest points per dollar in a way that you kind of want to go go with it um i think like more contrarian plays of the flavor stewart mentions are your kind of mike davis Najee harris uh james robinson and those are great guys too i would like to have a decent number of those plays but um i think Calera is good chalk okay going to the next game on the docket Fourth highest total on the slate. It's 52. It opened at 52. It's currently 52. It is the Arizona Cardinals at the Jacksonville Jaguars. Cardinals are a seven and a half road favorite. A lot of road favorites. Uh, Cardinals with a 29.75 implied total. Jaguars with a 22.25 implied total. The ownership on this game is is pretty low. We have here at Roto Grinders, we our projections, ownership projections really have everyone in the single digits, pretty much. Uh, I think this game environment is going to be pretty good. Uh, The issue comes down is the, is the stacking is that, uh, you know, the Cardinals, as we said last week with Stewart, I'm much more likely to stack uh, Murray with cheaper receivers than rely on the fact that he needs that DeAndre Hopkins needs to get a ceiling at 8,200 while Murray puts up 35 points. But these receivers have actually come up in price now. Rondell Moore is 5,000. Christian Kirk's 5,400. Even A.J. Green's 4,500 now. And then on the Jacksonville side, I mean, Marvin Jones is wide receiver one, but, I mean, they're not the greatest of offenses. Uh, I It feels like I want to play the game stack of this game. I think it just comes down to I'm not really sure where to go. Yeah, I think I think it is uh, tough to figure out. Like I'm, I'm just kind of looking by our value projections, and none of, none of these guys are showing up as phenomenal values. Uh, I think on account of that price hike uh, that you mentioned, uh, you alluded to Chase Edmonds earlier. Like he has been a guy that I've been playing a lot of this year, and has not uh, paid off so far. But I, I, I do, you know, continue to like the spots for Edmonds. Uh, you know involved in the past game you're right not getting some of that goal line work but uh is clearly just like a more uh explosive and dynamic runner than than uh connor and you know i think there is potential for him to kind of break off like uh you know a a touchdown run from distance um man it is tough though to overlook like i mean kyler has just been on another level uh through two weeks and you know has yet again a, a strong matchup uh, it, it, it does become tough to kind of figure out who to pair him with. Um, well, Brandon, I, I mean, we have, we have Lamar, Lamar Jackson's cheaper, going to be higher own. You can't deny the fact that Kyler Murray has a ceiling to be QB one by far on the slate. Like, how do you handle situations like this where the game looks good, but the pieces don't necessarily look the greatest, like from a, from a price perspective. Um, I like to go ahead and, and in a fair number of lineups pay for the high end quarterbacks. I think it's one area where lineup construction has sort of changed over time where I think four years ago, it used to be the case when you had fewer rushing quarterbacks that what you wanted to do was be sort of cheap at QB, cheaper at running back, cheaper at tight end, high end on wide receiver. Um, I think now basically two things have happened that have made you want to shift more dollars towards QB. Um, One is obvious. We've got these elite rushing quarterbacks that are scoring huge amounts of fantasy points. Um, And the other thing is that the uh, sites have not fully adjusted the pricing to these huge rushing quarterbacks. And the pricing is, still roughly in line with what it is five years ago. What that means is that if you're categorizing your players, 
the highest points per dollar in general is at the quarterback position. So that means that you want to allocate more dollars to a quarterback. It's just week by week. If you're just projecting fantasy points and then doing fantasy points per dollar, because QBs are somewhat underpriced, the highest uh, points per dollar that are available tend to be at the quarterback position. Or rather, if you compare the quarterback category to the wide receiver category, quarterback just offers more points per dollar in general. So you want to allocate more dollars there. Um, so I, I kind of like paying for paying for these guys. And you look at last week, um, obviously Kyler was a guy you wanted in your lineup. He had a monster week, right? But Minnesota's defense also had a good week. They were also one of the best, if not the best defense to have on the week. I think they scored like 14 DraftKings points or 12 DraftKings points or something. So the point is like, yeah, I guess if Minnesota didn't have a good defensive game, maybe Kyler wouldn't have gotten as many opportunities and wouldn't have thrown quite as much. But, but Kyler had that elite fantasy production even though he made some mistakes, it wasn't like the perfect game for him. Like his ceiling is unbelievably high. Um, and so I would, I would not be afraid of like paying up for these uh, elite QBs. It might be something that you just want to do this week. Um, and I well, don't know. Do but what do you do in this game, Brandon? Pair, I, I mean, pair him with who? Run it back with who? I mean, you have the, these two $5,700 running backs in this game. That's right in your your favorite running back range. Like it, it feels like this game. I mean, it has a high total. It should be at a high pace. We saw that in the first game against the Texans that the Jaguars have no problem throwing the ball 40, 50 times. Like my, my, like I said before, my issue with the game is not the game. It's the, like, there's a lot of pieces. I mean, it, if I were to build uh lineups, I could, it feels like I could build 50 lineups of just this stack just to get like all the combinations of guys that I would want and how much, how much volume do I want to allocate to, uh, to the Arizona Jackson? I think it's, I think it's okay to play Hopkins at the high price along with Kyler at the high price. I think that's a, that's a fine thing to do. Um, I know you, you may, maybe you don't like paying, uh, so much at wide receiver. Um, now, through two games, Rondell Moore has been the guy. So there are going to be a lot of people that just go Rondell Moore, but I would, I would wager um, that the larger sample or, or that the, the consensus predictions prevail and Hopkins is the guy. So I would, I would not be afraid to run Kyler and Hopkins and what you're doing there is um, like uh, in MLB, you sort of take your reliable production from pitcher and get your variance at hitters um, where things are generally less variance. It, the style of lineup that you would be doing in a Kyler Hopkins lineup is you would, you would know that when you play Kyler, you need a ceiling game. You need him to be QB one or QB two on the week. So already when you've plugged Kyler in your lineup, you've made that, you, you've made that bet that you need him to be QB one or QB two. By adding Hopkins, all you're saying, you're, you're not making a strong statement. All you're saying is that conditional on Kyler being QB one or QB two, uh, Hopkins is also going to have a very good day. It's not something outlandish that you're betting on. Um, and then you're kind of knowing that you're going to have to chase ceiling performances elsewhere in your lineup. Right. The point that I was making last week with Hopkins and Murray was that with Murray having his ceiling tied very much to rushing touchdowns, that his rushing touchdowns come at the expense of Hopkins touchdowns. So these rushing type quarterbacks, I'm less likely to play the high priced wide receiver with him because the lower cost players and AJ green, if he has a, uh, a, a five 
for 60 in a touchdown game for like 19 points. Like that's much more satisfactory than Hopkins having a 19 point game because Kyler rushed it in twice. Like for the statue quarterbacks, like Tom Brady, like I have no problem playing an AK wide receiver with those guys because I'm not afraid of the quarterback necessarily. His Lamar ceiling, Kyler ceiling, uh, to some extent, Josh Allen ceiling, these Russian quarterbacks, Jalen Hurts ceiling. It's like, it makes me think more about the high price wide receivers only because the quarterback themselves could vulture them for their price. So the combined expense may not be worth it. I, like, like uh, Stuart, I remember that you tweeted it out because uh, we talked about it, that like at like that 50th, 60th percentile, Kyler and, and DeAndre Hopkins are correlated, but at like the 80th, 90th percentile, they're actually not. Yeah, it's like a ceiling game. Uh, correlation, the idea is that nothing ever implies one thing. It just has an elevated probability of some alternate kind of uh, outcome occurring. And yeah, like, like you said, you know, a uh, 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 median to ceiling game for Kyler uh, increases the probability of DeAndre going kind of median or better. Um, but like a, a 80th, 80th percentile plus for Kyler doesn't necessarily... Uh, have like a like a high probability or, or a, a much more elevated probability of of Hopkins going 80th percentile or better. Uh, it, it, it really uh, increases kind of the probability of kind of a secondary or cheaper guy like say Kirk. You know, we saw it last week with Moore, of course, uh, uh, getting to that 80th plus percentile game. Um, you know, I think I think it's I think it's a a, a, uh, a pretty good concept to kind of incorporate and think about as you're uh, as you're building like Kyler stacks and, and really any stack uh, with kind of these Russian quarterbacks, um, you know, the, the, them having a big game uh, could, could be a huge running game. Doesn't necessarily imply like big game for expensive wide receiver one. Yeah, it's a good point. And I think that um, maybe, maybe the play is you, you do take the occasional uh, Edmonds um <clears throat> Edmonds play just going on the field is not going to play him for the reasons that you mentioned blender that they, they think he's not going to get the, the goal line work, but um, maybe if he has a couple of long runs on a dump off um, both QB and running back could get there. And then you, you sort of take your chance with the cheaper wide receiver. Okay. Let's it's go a to tough our game to stack just because you're you, hard to know who to come back with on Jackson. Right. Day. Right. right. That's right. the main right. thing. But the last game on the docket, we have the Ravens at the Lions. 50 total. It opened at 49. It's now up to 50. The Ravens, predictably, seven and a half point road favorite. Uh, Ravens with a 28.75 implied total. Lions with a 21.25 implied total. Uh, Stewart, uh, would would I be weird to say that this may be one of my favorite games on the slate? No, I mean, I, I think it is my, my favorite game on the slate or I, I don't know. I don't really have uh, strong opinions, but I would say well, I'm just going based on ownership. I'm looking. Yeah. The thing is, is that I see uh, Lamar is going to be, is going to be one of the higher on quarterbacks, probably, probably going to be in a lot of cash game lineups, I guess. The problem is, is that uh, not many of the other people in the game are going to be, I think many people view the Ravens as, Heavy run, which they are. The Lions as horrible. And, you know, it's, it's only a 7.5, you know, spread. But I don't, I don't think I'm... We currently have Marquise Brown at 7% ownership. I, at, he's 5,600. And based on his first two games production, it's quite possible that it'll be week 10 and we'll wonder... Like, why was Marquise Brown ever 5,600? Because he's now 7,900. And if I'm going to exploit that, I want to exploit that as, as, as quickly as possible. So it feels like I could, play, I could play Lamar with a single stack always because he's a Russian quarterback. And then I could fill the tight end with the actually the opposite side. Most people, we have Andrews with 12% ownership, but we have Hawkinson with six that a way to, to, to build around this game is to just play Lamar with Marquise Brown 
and TJ Hawkinson, or even DeAndre Swift, because he's 5,800. He's in that, uh, that, that Brandon Adams range of running backs that we're looking for that does catch passes. Uh, I just think people are going to avoid this game thinking that the Ravens are going to roll them over. Yeah, no, I, I, I love this game. Our, our numbers love this game. We have the Ravens as kind of the stack team with the best simulated ROI of plus 35%. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think we need to kind of discuss Jackson. Like, of course, uh, you know, potentially the highest, you know, we have him as the highest ceiling on the slate. I think him or Murray, you can make a case for. And yeah, I mean, they're, they're condensed. Like, you know, Marquise Brown, uh, he had a 39% target share last week. 20 in week one, like he looks awesome. Uh, like what's wrong with Sammy Watkins? I mean, he's had 27% target share his first two weeks. Uh, he, he seems to be a uh, integral part of the offense. Uh, like you said, like Andrews, I think is probably going to catch the most ownership of these uh, Baltimore skill players. Uh, I, I think he's a fine spot, but, but my preference would be uh, to go with Brown or Watkins actually. And then, yeah, I mean, there's a lot, uh, well, not a lot, but I would say uh, compelling pieces on the Detroit side uh, to choose from. Like you mentioned, Hawkinson, uh, Swift, I think is, um, you know, a great option. Like I wouldn't even overlook, say, a guy like Jamal Williams. He has, uh, you know, I uh, don't love the price on him, but he has uh, factored in in the passing game in a not insignificant way. Uh, yeah, I, th I think there's a lot you can do with this game. Uh, Lamar feels like kind of the most stable option. And uh there are some, uh, I think, compelling but con condensed pieces on the Baltimore side uh, as well as the Detroit side. So uh, I'm very interested in this game uh, as it stands now. I think this will probably be uh, the team that I, I kind of stack up the most uh, in my builds. Brandon, Baltimore, we normally would see like Ravens-Lions. Like you would expect, it's like, oh, run heavy and, and the Lions are, you know, bad team. Like you'd expect this game to be like, uh, you know, like a 44 total or something, but it's a 50 total. Uh, common sense. I mean, by the way that these teams play would think that the pace of this game is not fast, but I can't deny the fact that it's a 50 total. Are, are, what, are, what are your thoughts on this game in general? Cause I know you must like Lamar cause obviously he has a high ceiling to be QB one, but the other pieces in the game are really not going to be all that owned. And I think people are going to be focused on all the other games that we mentioned. Yeah. It's the sort of simple play that we've, we've already mentioned, but I, I do like the Marquise Brown pairing quite a bit. Um, he has the right distribution for tournaments. Historically, he can put, put the ceiling games in. Um, so that that simple stack is my favorite. Um, I do, I do sense that the kind of, I do sense that Arizona is more likely to score 45 points than, than Baltimore. Um, I, I see uh, that game has a little bit more appeal for me than it does for the two of you. Um, but, but I like, I like this game quite a bit as well. Is the lack of appeal more the fact of the opponent? Because like in all the other games, the get like the spread is much closer, and this one it's over a touchdown. Is it more that that it's less likely to the Ravens are less likely to score forty five only because the Lions are going to put up very little, may put up very little resistance, and the Ravens won't need to. That's that's kind of the way I see it. Like um, I could just easily see the Arizona game going three quick touchdowns for Arizona and Jax comes back, scores two quick touchdowns and you get kind of, I could see the shootout develop much, much more readily um, in the Arizona game. But um, I, I also like this Baltimore game and historically uh, Andrews has been a great tournament um, tight end play. He's had a, a, an excellent distribution for his price. Okay, Brandon, we're going to let you go. I know you have a hard out. and uh, yeah, Sorry about that. No problem, but me and Stuart will go over the rest, right? We, uh, we, have, we went over all the games that have a 50-plus total. Are there any games that don't have that high of a total, Stuart, that stand out to you as possibly, you know, kind of under the radar, possibly, you know, based on the price, based on the ownership that, that you're looking into this week? 
Well, I got uh, I got one pretty ugly one and one I think less less ugly one. Um, maybe we can start uh, with the more ugly one. But um, man, I mean, I you know we, we've talked a good bit about some of these rushing upside quarterbacks. You know, Lamar, Kyler, Russell to a lesser extent. I mean, I'm a little intrigued by. Uh, I don't love the skill. Say it. Pieces, say it. I know. I think I know who you're gonna say. You know, Daniel Jones. I think I, to me. You uh, did it. <laughs> is is interesting what are, what are we doing though with the skilled players like that's kind of where i get lost like i love jones just as a qb value that's going to get no ownership uh, i like the upside there but like talk to me about what you're thinking because i haven't given it too much thought like i, I guess slayton is interesting um i, don't, well, I think I, it I, also that... depends at, at Stewart. it depends on their injury report because uh evan ingram is trending in the right direction, but I don't know. Galladay, I just, I'm just looking on Twitter now. I don't think he's practiced yet. So, I, I mean, it seems like Shepard is the only guy that, you know, Shepard and Slayton, just these guys are cheap. I mean, like, Shepard isn't that cheap. He's 5,900. But, like, if Engram is in and Galladay is out, like, then, I mean, you got Engram at 3,600. It seems like if any of these guys are out, I don't mind. I don't mind single stacking. Daniel Jones is a Russian quarterback, so I don't mind – you know, just doing one. Uh, you got the obvious bringbacks in Ridley and Pitts. Uh, I mean, it just, it, to me, it's like, to me, it's these these stacks are easy to build because I I know who I'm get, getting. I'm, I'm not going to chase the Cordell Patterson game, right? Saquon Barkley is going to be pot. And, and the thing is, is that ba- Barkley is going to get ownership at running back. So playing the Jones plus pass catcher and the Ridley Pitts or, you know, kind of a run back, I think, like, how many combinations of that? Like, it feels like if I was building 150 lineups, I could build 10 of those lineups, and they, the stack would all look the same. Maybe I rotate uh, Shepard with Slayton, maybe Ridley with Pitts, but it's not like the, like the Arizona game where it feels like I can make, like, 100 different combinations of this. To me, this almost seems – it seems too simple. It, it just The fact is that, that these aren't these, – these teams are not good. Right? I mean, like, this could be in a completely inefficient game. Or it could be a completely mess defensively, and this game goes, you know, thirty-eight to thirty-five, and and you're wondering why the hell didn't you play more? Yeah, well, when you talk through, um, yeah, those Giants receiving options, especially if Gallaudet doesn't play, yeah, I mean, it makes makes a lot of sense. Um, I think just at the outset, I was uh, I was liking Jones and kind of not sure what to do uh, at skill skill position there, but. Uh, you know, I think it does make sense. And uh, I I hadn't looked closely at our Giants receiver numbers, but actually have pretty decent uh, grades on Slayton and um, uh, Shepard. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I'm happy you don't see you. Uh, you, you see the beauty in uh, a, a yeah, like you said, a train wreck of a Giants team. But um, I don't know. The other one I had was uh, Tennessee. I think just uh, go back against like. Uh, you know, the big Henry game. And we have yet to see like a big, uh, big Tannehill, AJ Brown game. Uh, I think those are you know, two efficient, highly skilled guys. Um, so that was kind of the, the, what I considered to be like the less ugly uh, of, of the two kind of re- best of the rest games. Um, yeah. I, I, I like that game from a secondary stack perspective. Okay. Like, like it feels, it feels like, like, I don't even know who's going to start for the Colts. So it could be Eason, it could be Hunley, Wentz, it depends. Uh, the problem I, I, I typically have with the backup quarterback type of situations, especially in their first start, is that I, I typically the, the offenses will be much more conservative, right? So that limits the shootout potential of, of, the, of the, the game as a whole. So I have to think that Eason has to throw a ball a ton and be efficient with it. So, like, if that doesn't happen, well, is Tannehill going to have to throw the ball 35 times? Well, probably not either. So, like, while I could see playing, uh, you know, A.J. Brown on one side and then Jonathan Taylor on the other side or Pittman on the other side or just play A.J. Brown or Julio, just play one Titan or some play Derrick Henry. I mean, something like that. Uh, I'm just I'm just a little wary on the the backup quarterbacks i could say the same thing because i looked at the the bills game the bills versus washington 
Now Heineke, you know, I, I has played a game since. So now maybe they feel a little bit more comfortable letting him go a little bit more. But those are the only concerns. It's like, I don't mind playing the Lions, who are probably a worse team than those teams. But at least it's, it, it's Jared Goff. And I'm not saying that Jared Goff is a great quarterback. But they built the offense around. They know he's the starting quarterback. And that's they're going to play the way that they play. Uh, when, when backups are thrown into these starting roles, I, I just can't figure that they're going to be chucking the ball. So, so that's my concern on the game stack by using the quarterback. But the one-off pieces, I have no problem. Got it. Um, yeah, no, that, that, that Is there any data to support? I'm saying this completely out of thin air. Is there, is there any data to support, support even what I'm saying? It feels, in, it feels intuitively correct, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's not. Maybe I'm overweighting that. Yeah, I don't have any data on 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 that type of thing, um, and it would be a bit of work to to kind of pull something together. But um, intuitively, I mean, it makes sense. Um, so, I mean, I'm just curious by that by that logic. Are you probably uh, are you kind of uh, pessimistic on on your outlook for a guy like Justin Fields, who I know has been, uh, you know, I think has been kind of talked up on account of his his kind of rushing upside. Uh, imagine you can, I mean, there's a lot of backup quarterbacks in this week fields, uh, Tua should be out. Um, I feel like there's one more, but, um, either I'm wrong or they're just escaping me. Uh, but, but it sounds like you're, you're kind of going to be underweight then on a guy like fields and potentially, well, not, if, well, would you be like, say underweight on a guy like Mooney, um, who I think also, you know, could, could garner some, just a little bit of ownership maybe as a one-off, but I mean, what the, the bears have a 19.25 implied total. So like, like I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to win GPPs. Like if he, if he gets 50 yards rushing, yeah, he can make value for his price. If he gets 18 to 20 points, like, yeah, okay. You got it. But I mean, we have, we have five games that are 50 plus that we may have quarterbacks that get 35. And, and once that happens, like, then what do I care? Right. And especially against the Browns who are more run heavy anyway, it's just like, I don't see the Bears versus Browns as the shootout game, right? I'm more likely to see the Bills versus the Washington be the shootout. I'm more likely to see the Bengals versus the Steelers as a shootout game. And that's a, that's a 44 total. It's just like even the Broncos, I'm more likely, I think I'm more likely to play Teddy Bridgewater than I am to play uh, Justin Fields. And it's not because Justin Fields doesn't have value. It's just that he, I don't think, I don't think that built lineup has the best GPP ceiling, but if you if, to, to make value, sure. Okay. Maybe Justin Fields has a good day. He rushes for a touchdown has 60 yards rushing. He throws for one. Like does the stack get there? I mean, I don't How does the stack get there? What? Cause then, then you have the Browns who could, I mean, they throw to backup fullbacks. I mean, like who knows what they're going to do. So like, it's quite possible that like no one, that no one in this game gets there. So like, like what, why am I so thrilled about, about playing any stack? If, if I look at a game and I go, I'm not sure if anyone gets there, let alone play three or four guys from it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I think we're probably seeing that eye to eye. Uh, so are there any other games that haven't been mentioned? It sounds like Buffalo, you're, you're Buffalo, Washington. Are, are you it's, thinking it's about Josh that? Allen, Stuart? I mean, it's kind of like any game that he's the quarterback and the Bills, you know, they pass first type of offense. Is it the best matchup? No, it's not. But I don't think the ownership is going to necessarily be there. I don't think it's going to be low, but I don't think it's going to be that high. I could see myself sprinkling like Josh Allen lines. I'm not excited about it. Like it's much, I'm much more excited about the Ravens Lions or, or, or the Seahawks Vikings or, you know, some of the games that we mentioned that aren't the Rams Buccaneers. Then, like last week, I devoted a tunnel lineup to Josh Allen, and that that didn't work out. Yes, but, man. but I, if they if the Bills are going to run their offense the way they run their offense, it feels like if even if I play twenty five single entry three max type of lineups like I did last week alongside my one fifty build, I can't see myself every week playing at least at least three Buffalo lineups. I mean, I was like, no matter what he looks like now. Like there's gonna be there's gonna be one or two games this season where Josh Allen puts up 42 fantasy points and supports like three wide receivers in the process. Uh, who knows what weeks that's gonna be, but at least I'll have some exposure every week. Yeah, 
Yeah, and you can get like uh, Allen, Diggs, McLaurin with, with pretty pretty low ownership. I mean, I, f- I just feel like I, I see kind of what you're saying. I mean, they're, is that the way you would kind of think about this mostly through kind of those three guys? Um, with Allen, to me, it feels like a guy you probably want to double, double stack up. Um, Allen? What do you mean yeah. by Allen? Josh Allen, you would want. Oh, Josh him. Allen. Okay, yeah. I would, for some reason, I was thinking Kyle Allen. I'm like, no, he's not. What, what are we talking? Yeah, no, I'd no, be no. more likely to do uh, Allen plus Diggs plus one of Sanders or Beasley, and then run it back with either like a book, McLaurin, even Antonio Gibson. I mean, Logan Thomas in a tight end spot or, or something. I mean, to me, it's fairly simple. I mean, you could play Dawson Knox if you want to just punt at tight end. I I just think Josh Allen stacks are typically doubles. And how many combinations of those can there possibly be? Essentially, you're including Diggs with any of them. It's Diggs and a cheaper wide receiver. Beasley's 4,800. Sanders is 4,200. So it's not even price prohibitive. And then the guy on the other side could be, I mean, pick pick a guy. I mean, it's perfectly. Diane, Diami Brown at 3,600 is even doable on this late. Or Humphreys, even, if you want it. I mean, like, the the price point is not even not even bad. So like that, why, why, why wouldn't I have some bills lineups, even though arguably it's, it's not, it's not the greatest, it's not the greatest of spots for a, for a shootout, but we've said that before about the bills. And then, and then the, and the game goes 42 to 28 out of nowhere, because, you know, Josh Allen chucks for three touchdowns in the first quarter. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, at, at the price point that like McLaurin and Diggs are at, you know, you got cup at 68, you know, Keenan at 66, Godwin 61. I mean, like these guys are just going to get overlooked just because of the price point they're at. Like, I think a lot of people searching to fill kind of their last, you know, of course the people that are stacking Los Angeles are going to have cup or going to have woods or whatever, but even for the people that are kind of like, Oh, well, you know, I need a one-off receiver at this price point to fill up kind of my last spot. I think you're going to get a lot more people gravitating towards the cups, the Allens, you know, the Godwins, uh, Tyreek is, I guess, significantly higher, but um, no, yeah, I, I think that makes sense. I mean, talented guys, low ownership, uh, typically is is makes for good plays. And people should gravitate towards advanced sports analytics and your sub stack, right? You're going to be putting that out. I'm assuming today and tomorrow, and people could people could sign up for that, right? Yeah. If they join, it's not free anymore, though, right? Right. Yeah. So tomorrow morning, I think we'll, we'll come out with it. Um, and it's going to have like a lot of the metrics that I'm referring to on this show, uh, put in a table, I'll do an update uh, later tonight for any uh, spread changes, or if we get more, you know, news on some of these injury or COVID instances. Um, yeah. And that's $10 a month. So that's kind of the, the thinking there is that for kind of a cheap price, you can get access to the, uh, condensed uh kind of numbers that we're looking at from our tools uh or you can sign up for the site uh at a higher price point and not only do you get access to that article but you also get access to the tools themselves so uh you know i think for some people just kind of reading reading the uh the the summary or the cliff notes uh is the right fit for other people uh you know who want to who want to look at all the numbers uh look at kind of the guts of, of where this stuff is coming from uh you know, it's just a full subscription to the site uh, with, with the tools uh, might make more sense. So go to advanced sports analytics.com. If you're on YouTube, like, and subscribe, hit that thumbs up button. Give me those thummy thumbs. If you enjoy this show, uh, if you're playing on FanDuel this week, make sure to sign up for the DFS OGs FanDuel contest for NFL week three. And, uh, and you can compete with beer makers, fan head chopper, notorious, it's a well-structured contest. There'll be a link in the description if you're playing over on FanDuel. And, uh, and, and as always, rate and review in iTunes on the Fantasy Football Podcast feed for Roto-Grinders. So for Stuart Gibson, I'm Jordan Cooper, and we'll see you next week on another edition of the Advanced Sports Analytics Show here on rotogrinder.com. 